Warning, the following podcast contains massive spoilers. If you haven't seen Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra yet, and don't mind spoilers, hopefully this podcast will inspire you to watch along with us. Now let's begin. Welcome to Beyond Benny, a show about a bunch of millennials analyzing an animated kids show, Avatar, The Last Airbender. I'm your host, Marilyn Chantala, and today's special guest I have... Hi, I'm Mark Neely. I am an avid fan of animation, anime, western cartoons, all that good stuff. I watched most of Avatar. There's parts of it that are a little blank, so doing this rewatch and analysis is going to help me kind of find a better loving for the show, I think. You haven't seen all of it? Not all of it. I watched majority of it each season. I think I might have missed a couple episodes here and there. So they're probably like little plot points and things that I might have missed. Oh, okay. Well, this podcast will definitely help with that. (laughs) All right, let's just jump right to it. So today's episode, we're going to be talking about episode three, The Southern Air Temple, book one, Water. A title card of the episode pops up, but instead of the usual white background, the background is a sunrise. The gang is getting ready to head to the Southern Air Temple. Aang tells Katara that the Air Temple is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Katara tells Aang that it's been a long time since he's been home and that he shouldn't get his hopes up. Aang says he needs to see it for himself before he can believe it. Aang tries to wake up Sokka, but Sokka refuses to get up. He grabs the stick and pretends that there's a prickle snake (laughs) in Sokka's sleeping bag. Sokka starts freaking out, and Aang's like, great, you're awake, and tells Sokka that they should head out. We cut to Zuko and Uncle Iroh docking the ship. Zuko says that they have to hurry and doesn't want to stay long because he's afraid that they're going to lose the Avatar's trail. He warns Uncle Iroh to not mention the Avatar to anyone on the docks because he wants to be the only one hunting him. Commander Zhao overhears the conversation and starts walking towards them. He starts questioning Zuko and Uncle Iroh about what caused the damage to the ship. They say it was from crashing into an Earth Kingdom ship, but Commander Zhao doesn't believe them. He invites them for a drink later, but Zuko denies the invitation. Uncle Iroh apologizes for Zuko and tells Commander Zhao that they'll join him. We cut back to the gang flying on Appa. Sokka's stomach starts growling. He tries to find his rubber seal jerkies, but the bag is empty. Aang apologizes and says he used it to start the campfire (laughs) the previous night and that he didn't know what it was. Sokka says that's why the flame smelled so good (laughs) last night and he gets really sad. They get to the Batola mountain range and Aang says that they're almost there. Katara warns Aang for what he might find and explains how the Fire Nation is ruthless and how they killed her mom. They could have done the same to Aang's people, but Aang doubts this because the only way to get to an airbender temple is on a flying bison. Aang tells Appa to yip yip, and Appa flies at like a 90 degree angle (laughs) straight up into the sky. They finally reach the top of the Batola Mountains, and just up ahead, we see the Southern Air Temple! Wow! Katara is blown away by the sight of it, and Aang tells Appa that they're finally home. (laughs) That's sad. Oh man. Considering what's coming up. (laughs) Sad, sad. So I just want to start out by saying that besides the season finale, Mm -hmm. this is the first title card that there's something in the background. Like Uh, it's not a white background. Gotcha. And it's a sunrise. I guess that's like the creator saying, okay, the show is starting. The first two episodes is exposition, Mm -hmm. but the show is literally starting right now. I mean, that makes sense because this is where you find out a lot more about the world that's actually currently in. Because in the first few episodes, you're just kind of being introduced to the characters, especially with Aang just waking up, ah, I'm just back in the world. But now this episode really kind of brings full scope of what has happened in the time that he was in the iceberg. I think that's really important to this whole story, obviously. Okay, so I get that Aang just wants to go home, but he doesn't have to trick Sokka into thinking that he's about to die in order for him to wake up. That's like, okay, just pour water on his face or something. You don't have to... <laughs> there's a what is it a prickle, prickle snake, snake? <laughs> there's a snake in my boot well yeah i mean i think that just kind of goes in with old ang's very nonchalant about things so he's just kind of childish he doesn't really think about other people i mean i'm sure he cares about other people but i think he's still a kid definitely at heart where he just thinks of it as a prank 
I mean, Sokka's very kind of like, he always seems like he's always like that on edge guy anyway, so that probably wasn't the best choice for the people to play a prank on. But yeah, it was kind of rude. <laughs> and then it doesn't help that Sokka, in a way, is being inconsiderate too, because literally Aang just wants to get home. <sighs> yeah. Like, he can't even wake up. I don't know. <laughs> just be groggy the whole time, dude. <laughs> yeah, and then he's he's obviously just, like... he He's definitely just being all dragged along on his journey. You could obviously tell. And I think that's kind of important to his development as a character for Sokka as well. And that he's the straight man. He's kind of the character that most people could put their shoes in. Just because if they were put into this situation, they'd be kind of like, What do I do? What is going on? <laughs> I'm just trying to live each day. But that's just kind of a trope with a lot of cartoons and a lot of shows. They always have to have that guy that's just a grumpy grump. And I think it kind of helps cut the tension sometimes, I think, too. The pacing of it is just prolonging the inevitable <laughs> when Aang does find out. Yeah. I, I think it's the lightheartedness of the episode here and there kind of helps ease the viewer into what's about to transpire, especially since, I mean, you obviously know something's up with how Katara's acting and stuff like that. It just shows that Aang really doesn't know the genocide and all that stuff. So he doesn't know, but obviously she knows something. Yeah, and then she mentions how... Because in the first episode, Katara says, ever since mom died. So mm. we know that the mom is dead, the father is at war. But she tells Aang, like, the Fire Nation killed my mom. Mm. They could have done the same to your people. And so this is when we find out how her mom passed away. Mm. And it's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> I think it really, and again, it, like you said, this is the beginning of the story. This really helps you kind of, it creates clear lines about who are the good guys right now and the bad guys. I mean, obviously there's some gray areas with some of the characters from each of the nations later on, but, you know, you don't really know that yet. But all you know is firebenders generally bad. Yeah. Much. And Aang is so hopeful. He's like, no, like, I'm pretty sure they escaped. When you finally do see the southern air temple it's so gorgeous mm. and it's like so high up what is it Appa flew like a hundred <laughs> feet straight up into the sky like yeah. it was the highest peak of any mountain I, I think the thing that's really interesting about this whole episode and the show in general and this is really where it creates a lot of that stuff the background and as well as like the architecture and a lot of different things really play into effect of what the beauty of everything in it the show the southern air temple is drawn to be very like mythical you know the music really helps with that it's very hidden away obviously it's based off of like the monks that have temples in the mountains it really creates that mysteriousness around them, especially since you don't really know much about them besides, you know, Aang came from them. Yeah. Let's talk about Uncle Iroh and Prince Zuko on the docks. <laughs> I was watching this again, and specifically the interaction when they first get there, and they're like, so what happened? And then Zuko's just kind of like, uh, well, you know, it kind of still made me like realize, oh, uh, he's still kind of likable, even though he's a bit of a jerk and he's a bit angsty. Yeah. It kind of, it just, it's those little cracks in his veneer where he tries to act tough, but he, he's still a teenager that just doesn't really know what he's doing. Uncle Iroh, again, you guys talked about how it seems like he doesn't care too much. Like sometimes he's just very like, eh, whatever. <laughs> um, I think it's really cool, though, that that dynamic is always there. The serious kid who's always trying to prove himself. While well, you have Uncle Iroh, who's just kind of... He's just very peaceful and calm with things, even though the situation seems pretty bleak yeah. at times. <laughs> so bringing in Commander Zhao to interact with these two, it kind of really shows, like, Commander Zhao, he's he's a jerk. He's a big... He, do, are we allowed to cuss on this? Yes. He's a big asshole. He's just <laughs> he's just an asshole. And you have Zuko, while he is angsty and Iroh just very calm, they seem, well, at least in Zuko's case, he seems redeemable still. You really get this vibe that he is just trying to prove to his dad that he could do things on his own, which obviously later on, that is not the case. He needs to prove for himself that he could do things. But... Just getting those two types of people from the Fire Nation, it's very interesting to see where you have a guy that's the commander of this Fire Nation who's just obviously just a big jerk. While you have Uncle Iroh, who's very calm, collected, he's still kind of, he seems nice. You seem like you like him, and you obviously do like him still. And then obviously if he puts as much effort into, you know, taking care of Zuko, Zuko has something that Iroh sees. So I think that's really kind of cool in this whole interaction. But the thing you can take away from this, Commander Zhao is a dick. I don't like him. 
Yeah. And it's so funny because Prince Zuko's trying to lie mm. and Uncle Iroh is not smooth. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's not smooth at all. <laughs> and he's like, right, what did we... How did the ship get damaged again? Yeah, they kind of dropped the ball on that one, but I like their interaction a lot. It's interesting because Uncle Iroh is like, show Commander Zhao some respect. Mm -hmm. Like, he's an elder, he's also a commanding officer, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we get a hint in this episode that Commander Zhao is like a really big asshole, but yeah. you don't really see it till later. Yeah. And so, as of right now, Prince Zuko looks very disrespectful, mm -hmm. but at the end of this episode, it's like very valid. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's validated. <laughs> I think the main thing is that Uncle Iroh right now is honestly just trying to keep Zuko out of trouble. And that's the biggest thing is because obviously Zuko is a bit of a hothead and he knows that. So he's just trying to be like, hey, we don't want anything crazy to happen while we're doing this mission, looking for an avatar and stuff like that. So you got to be careful with who you bump heads with. And I think that's kind of a lesson that Iroh is trying to teach him without actually directly telling him. You have to pick your battles. And I think that's the thing that Zuko doesn't really realize right now, especially in this episode. You see later on when he does pick his fight with, <laughs> with Zhao, Iroh is just trying to guide Zuko along being like, make sure you know what you're doing and where you're at. Yeah, that's true. But let's move on. So we're back at the docks. Commander Zhao is telling Uncle Iroh and Prince Zuko how the Fire Nation plans on taking down the Earth Kingdom by year's end and that they'll finally win the war. Zuko calls his dad a fool for thinking that the whole world is going to be fine with this. Commander Zhao changes the subject and asks Zuko how he's doing with finding the Avatar. Right when he says this, <laughs> Uncle Iroh fumbles and knocks over <laughs> a whole stack of Fire Nation weapons and makes loud noise. Zuko says he hasn't found him yet, and Commander Zhao starts patronizing him by saying, Did you really expect to? He probably died like a hundred years ago, which causes Zuko to look away. Commander Zhao picks up on this and questions him some more. Zuko tries to play it off, but Commander Zhao is not convinced. Zuko tries to leave the tent, but Commander Zhao's soldier stops him. After interrogating Zuko's men, one of the soldiers tells Commander Zhao that the damage on Zuko's ship was caused by the Avatar and that he let him get away. Commander Zhao walks up to Prince Zuko and questions him again. How exactly was his ship damaged? We cut to the Southern Air Temple. Aang is running towards the entrance while Sokka is complaining about how hungry he is. Katara scolds Sokka and says that an outsider like him should be grateful <laughs> to even be at the Southern Air Temple in the first place. Aang starts giving them a tour of the playground but stops midway and sighs. He tells Katara and Sokka how the place used to be filled with monks and lemurs and bison. Sokka tries to cheer Aang up by agreeing to play airball with him, but it doesn't turn out well for Sokka. <laughs> Aang's airball hits Sokka with so much force that it knocks him off the field and into a heaping pile of snow. As Sokka recovers, he sees a battered Fire Nation helmet on the floor. Sokka wants to show it to Aang. Katara calls him over. Just before Aang sees the helmet, Katara hesitates and buries the helmet and Sokka with snow by waterbending. Sokka tells Katara that she can't protect him forever. He keeps trying to convince Katara for the rest of the day to tell Aang, but she doesn't want to break his heart. Aang shows Sokka and Katara a statue of Monk Gyatso and tells them how he was Aang's mentor and the greatest airbender in the world. Aang bows to the statue, and just as he does, we get a flashback! Monk Gyatso is teaching Aang how to bake a cake, but Aang is pretty bummed out and he's not paying attention. Monk Gyatso asks what's wrong, and Aang says he thinks that the monks made a mistake. Monk Gyatso says that the only mistake that they made was telling him that he was the Avatar before he was 16. He tells Aang to not be distracted by this, and instead to live in the moment. The camera zooms out to reveal a stunning view of the Southern Air Temple with bisons flying everywhere. Aang doesn't think that he's ready to be the Avatar, and Monk Gyatso says that all of his questions will be answered when he's ready to enter the Air Temple Sanctuary. Inside the sanctuary, Aang will meet someone to guide him. Before Aang can ask more questions, Monk Gyatso changes the subject and asks Aang to help him with the cakes. The two launch the cakes into the sky, and they land on a couple of monks across the <laughs> temple. Aang snaps out of the flashback. Katara tells Aang that he must miss him, but Aang shrugs it off. He starts walking towards the air temple sanctuary, and tells Katara and Sokka that he has someone to meet. Ooh, mysteries abound. Where do we start? Ugh. I guess this is a thing that I, I kind of liked about this episode a lot is um, there's a lot of dynamic in the mood. You have your very serious scenes with the Fire Nation. Most of the Air Temple stuff seems mostly lighthearted. 
Um, obviously, you have some stuff in there that's going to get a little darker, a little sadder, especially with stuff revolving around Aang's past. But I like that you kind of get the essence of... I mean, let's let's face it. This, this show is a cartoon. I think that the best thing about the show is that while it has its very serious topics, its very serious conversations, it still acknowledges that it's a cartoon at the end of the day. They have their sound effects when they make stupid things happen, you know, like when Aang does his little heart thing to Sokka after knocking him out. <laughs> or it was a zero or something. I don't remember what he does, but he makes the movement and it makes a little sound loop with it. Those little sound quips here and there, you know, it's still very, you can't get a lot of these things, these elements outside of cartoons. But yeah, starting with the story itself, this is when it starts getting more serious. Um, obviously, you get your sepia flashback with Gyatso and everything. It's a common trope to have like master sensei kind of thing <laughs> uh, going on. And I think that's kind of helping establish Aang's character as well. He obviously takes a lot after him. Um, the little prank they pulled on the monks was very important to Aang's character. That's kind of where it came back to the beginning part where he pulled a prank on Sokka. They like to play pranks. That's that's how they were. And um, I think that Gyato is trying to impart onto Aang that, you know, while he is the Avatar, he saw us enjoy, like he said, you know, to enjoy what you have right now. And I think that's important that Aang doesn't understand yet. And I think that's what he's trying to run away from almost in his mind, is that he's the Avatar. He's going to be a major player in what's happening right now. And I don't think he wants to. He doesn't want to face that because he's a kid. He wants to have fun and do pranks and stuff like that. I think everything that happens here at the Air Temple kind of it really hits Aang in the face with all that reality. Yeah, and then in the flashback, they tell us that they told Aang that he was the Avatar before he was 16. Mm. Like, imagine Harry Potter. And you know how Hagrid comes in and tells Harry, you're a wizard, Harry. (laughs) And then Harry's like, what, 11? Maybe like a year younger than Aang. But imagine if Hagrid came up to Harry and was like, you're a wizard, but also you are now the Minister of Magic (laughs) and you have to lead these people. Good luck. All right, let's go. Your training starts now. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of, it's really just making a person grow up a lot sooner than they're ready. And it sucks that that happens. And, you know, I think that's kind of one of the interesting themes and stories behind this whole show is that sometimes you have to take on this undertaking that seems almost insurmountable to you. But with the correct motivation and with people helping you out and as well as your own will to keep going, it, you could overcome these odds. That kind of stuff gets hit on Aang really early because he's going to save the world. Like the intro says, he's going to save the world and he kind of has to. And this is the beginning of that where you really start to see that this is his time to be serious, that he needs to start being ready for what's coming. Yeah. Also in the flashback, like pinpoint accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed those monks. Got them. I love Monk Yatsu so much. This flashback was only like, what, 20 seconds? And we learned so much. Like you said, we see it in Aang's character where Monk Yatsu incorporates fun into training. It's no better way to train than <laughs> pulling pranks on people. <laughs> yeah, especially with the airbending. I, I think the really cool thing about Gyatso and even this kind of parallels is Iroh is that there are these adult figures that you get two types of adults in this story. I think you really get the ones that are very like serious, the ones that are, we have to do this. This is our mission. You know, so people like Commander Zhao, Zuko's dad. But then you get characters that are very kind hearted and more willing to impart their knowledge in a different way. Mm-hmm. You have, you know, Gyatso and Uncle Iroh. Uh, later on, in a sense, you even have people like Boom Boom later on. who's was very... Boomy? Boomy. Did I say Boom Boom? You called him Boom <laughs> Let's cut that part. No, you called him Boom Boom. <laughs> See, this is this is why I'm bad at memorizing characters' names. I could just imagine if Boomy ever had a girl. Like, hey, Boom Boom, get over here. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> That's pretty cute, though. I like that. Uh, I'm going to use that now. Okay, his name is now Boom Boom because I, I'm bad <laughs> at remembering characters' names. A funny side note, when I... um. Because honestly, like I said, I, I watch most of the shows, so most of the main characters are, are really memorable to me. But obviously some characters here and there, I, the names I mess up. Gyatso, when I heard his name again, for some reason I thought it was like Iyatso or something Iyatso. Like that. <laughs> so I, one, I have bad hearing, and two, I have bad memory of character names. I apologize if I butcher any characters' names from here on out. I'll try my best to get it in the general park. But anyways, you get characters like Boomy later on who are, you know, fun-loving adults that still try their best to guide the young 
while still making sure that, you know, they don't fall into those traps of being like this adult that just cares about serious stuff all the time. And I think you can really get that with Iroh and Gyatso in this episode alone. And there's that little parallel that's kind of created between those two. And it kind of, it, it actually kind of connects Aang and Zuko a little bit. They both had these mentors just trying to guide them, but also making sure that they don't miss out on their life. They still get to experience fun. They still get to experience love and all that stuff. And I think that's really important with this episode, especially. Last thing I want to mention about the flashback is that when the pies do land on the other monks and all the lemurs like <laughs> hop up on them, you hear Momo's theme song. Like the oh, really? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Like, I guess you could say it's a lemur's theme song, but it undoubtedly is Momo's theme song. <laughs> no, I, I like where you're going with this. Um, I actually wanted to talk about it earlier throughout the whole episode. And I think throughout most of the show, there's always themes. And there's always background music going on during important, like, I guess, establishing shots with theme songs or something like that. You know, so at the very beginning scene when it's, you know, they're at the camp, it's a very calming sound that plays in the background as it pans over to the camp. When they arrive at the air temple, it's a very light theme. It's very, like we said earlier, mythical. It's got like some chimes and stuff like that. It just seems very airy. It feels very yeah. ethereal when Dream you get there. Like. Yeah. And with the Fire Nation, when they as soon as it starts, it's just very boisterous. It's very militaristic. It's a shot of the ship. It's very brooding. The songs are in itself. Almost, you know, the music is a character in the show as well because it really helps create this theme and creates a image for you. I think the biggest thing is that it could be something that could be easily overdone. It could be something that could easily kill the mood. But I think they use the music correctly, you know, to kind of establish these shots and to kind of give you that theme or that mood that you're going into what kind of scene. In that sense, you know, with the lemurs scene, you know, you're supposed to laugh. It's kind of silly. It's kind of dorky. So that song is very, very childlike. And I think that's really important, again, to helping create all all this atmosphere. That whole scene with Commander Zhao and Zuko, you get a sense of how mean Commander Zhao can get. And once he starts questioning him and he's trying to get it out of Zuko, he literally says, and I quote, If you have an ounce of loyalty left, you'll tell me what you found. Like, oh my god. It's tough because Zuko, I think his problem is that he really wants to, again, do this on his own. He wants to prove himself. So he's really trying as hard not to be defiant. But at the same time, he wants to because this is his fight. He's like, I need to do this. I need to. This is my mission, not yours. But this whole scene, it really elevates the idea that Commander Zhao really doesn't think anything of Zuko. He's even though he's royalty, he thinks he's just a kid still. And that is important that, yeah, Zuko is a teenager and he's, you know, he's not an adult yet. Kids, sometimes at young ages, really had to go through some stuff that some adults have never even had to go through. In the case of Zuko, he has to find the freaking Avatar <laughs> or, you know, forever be banished. While Zhao doesn't see Zuko as the person that could do that because he's still a kid. And I think that really creates that idea that Zhao is, he's very uppity. He doesn't like people below him. He's never going to see eye to eye with anybody. He's always above them. Yeah. Um, unless obviously it's like the king or something like that, probably. <laughs> Yeah, he definitely has a superiority complex. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Extremely. <laughs> and I remember watching it as a kid and getting mad at Zuko. Like, dude, he's just trying to help you. Yeah. Let him help you. When he says, if you have an ounce of loyalty left, tell me what happened. And Zuko doesn't tell him what happened. When I was little, I was really frustrated with Zuko. But now looking back, I'm like, no, it's pretty good call. He didn't tell him because Commander Zhao is a complete asshole yeah. <laughs> and doesn't deserve anything, mm. even respect. You're going to see these characters a lot differently because you understand the motivations a lot better. One, because when you're a kid, let's be honest, we didn't really read a lot of books and a lot of literature. So you don't really get nuances with characters, motivations and stuff like that. Especially back with older cartoons. It used to be silly stuff like Dexter's Laboratory with like adult jokes here and there. Avatar, honestly, now I'm looking back on it, was one of the first shows that I could think of really that I remember having such a serious adult narrative for a kid's show. Most of them are still very, you know, like, there's nothing that had that continuity kind of to it for a kid's show going, really. And then you see Commander Zhao being really meticulous, like mustache twirling, <laughs> um... Like a villain, like he's being a true villain right now. Yeah, because he basically went behind, I mean, like, I guess he doesn't owe anything to a banished prince, but he went behind their backs and interrogated their crew to get the truth. Mm. Like, he does find out that they had the Avatar and that they let the Avatar escape. 
you definitely see why Prince Zuko wanted to lie to him. And even when Zuko was trying to deflect the questions from Commander Zhao, you see Zuko trying to play the game. I think this is the first case where we see if you're in the Fire Nation, you have to play this certain game of chess. And if you mess up, it's very bad. <laughs> and then it gets really, really intense once Azula is introduced because every thought that she has is like a chess game. And it's really scary. <laughs> I think the best thing to gather from this whole scene really is that, well, even not this whole scene, this whole interaction with Zhao and Zuko is that Zuko was never the villain. I mean, he is in a sense that because he is an antagonist right now, especially to Aang and them. But even the first two episodes, you know, yeah, he's got his mission and he's the bad guy in those episodes. I think Zhao is the first true villain of the story, especially for this first book. The exposition was just of idea with Zuko is this character that will be kind of making his own journey along with Aang. But, you know, he's kind of more on the bad side right now. Right now, Zhao is introduced solely as a villain. Obviously, you're going to run into other antagonists as the story goes on. But I think Zhao is the first big villain that the team is going to run into. Yeah, I agree. Going back to Sokka trying to cheer up Aang, and Aang shows him like an airball game, and we see this field where they're just standing up on pillars, <laughs> <laughs> and Sokka's like fearing for his life, and Aang just shoots an airball that like ricochets like a pinball game, uh -huh. and hits Sokka with so much force that he flies through the goalpost shoots 20 feet away and lands in snow like Sokka should have died if wow. it wasn't for that snow <laughs> like boy something probably should have broke at that point <laughs> whether it be a bone or your spirit something was probably broken at that moment um and Aang did not help with his like hey I'm winning 7-0 <laughs> yeah so uh yeah I, I think the cool thing about Sokka in this scene is Although he's trying to tell Katara constantly you can't protect him and all stuff, he is still trying to be wary of Aang's situation. He's still being like, uh, you know what, cheer up, let's let's play some games. Something that might, you know, make you happy and stuff like that. To kind of push off what's going to happen a bit. It's so sweet of Sokka. It's really important because at the beginning, again, when you first meet Sokka in the first episodes, he's misogynistic kind of guy who just, you know, I'm macho man savage, <laughs> Randy man savage with everything. But um, at the end of the day, he's he's still a kid and he kind of understands Aang's situation because he lost his parents or at least his mom and his dad's off. Are they, is his dad still alive? I really don't remember. Yeah. They're just off at the war, right? So he's the man of the house. He's still trying to be that older brother. But at the same time, dude, he's a kid. He doesn't have family anymore. I got to help him out at least, you know, because I kind of understand what's going on. I think another interesting thing about this whole Southern Air Temple part, you kind of get to see Katara more in a motherly older sister role. Because while she is kind of like the mediator and she's like motherly sisterly role and she gets to be that older figure to Tang. this is definitely the beginning of you see their family kind of getting crafted at this point yeah and then you see her water bend yeah it seems like katara's i guess this is like a mutant trope <laughs> <laughs> they learn their powers through emotional motivation like katara freaks out and she's just like Joop! yeah bury Sokka in a bunch of snow <laughs> i'm gonna hide this oh yeah sorry brother you're gonna have to hide with it too <laughs> <laughs> and Sokka's just so annoying um uh, but yeah no i definitely i think this is kind of cool that we're seeing her powers develop right now too i, I think it's really cool because ang is going to be learning a lot too and growing but you get to see katara grow as well right? all the characters get to grow yeah and then after the flashback katara is like wow, you really must miss him. And she's talking past tense. And Aang, he doesn't know what to say. He's like, yeah, and walks away. <laughs> and I'm just like, Katara, dude, no. But at the same time, how does Aang respond to that? He doesn't yeah. want to accept it yet. It's so bittersweet. I think the thing that this show is really good at hiding, or at least not hiding, but acknowledging, is that Aang's not stupid. He's a kid and he's naive sometimes, but he really isn't stupid. And I'm pretty sure he kind of gets a sense of what's happened, especially with considering how empty the temple is. Yeah, and to him, he was there like maybe like a week ago or a month ago, the most. I don't know how long he was out when he was running away, but I assume it's like a month tops. That's so hard to digest. And then later we see it happening when he finally finds... Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's, let's continue. <laughs> so we reach the front of the Air Temple Sanctuary. 
Katara is skeptical and says there's no way someone would have been waiting for him for a hundred years inside the sanctuary. Aang reassures her by saying, like, look at me, I was stuck in an iceberg for a hundred years. <laughs> Completely reasonable. Aang is excited to finally have an avatar guide, but Sokka just wants to find food inside and tries to open the doors, but he fails. Aang tells him that the key to opening the door is airbending. Aang takes a deep breath and airbends into the door and it opens. The gang walks inside. We cut back to the docks. Commander Zhao is still interrogating Zuko. He calls Zuko pathetic and tells him that he's done with catching the Avatar and insults him some more. Zuko gets really upset and tries to physically assault him, but the soldiers hold him back. We cut back to the sanctuary. We see countless statues of people throughout the entire sanctuary. Sokka is disappointed that there's no food inside. Katara asks who these people are, and Aang says he's not sure, but that they all feel familiar to him. They notice that the statues are in a pattern, and Aang says it must be the Avatar cycle. Katara tells him that these people must be his past lives. Sokka doesn't believe it, and Katara reassures him and says that it's true. When the Avatar dies, he's reincarnated into the next cycle. Aang stares at a statue and goes in a trance. Katara snaps him out of it, and Aang reveals to her that it's Avatar Roku, the Avatar before him. Katara's like, how do you know that? <laughs> and Aang can't really answer her. The gang hears someone approaching, and they hide behind the statues. Sokka thinks that it's a firebender, but it's not. It's Momo! Aang shouts out, lemur! <laughs> and Sokka's like, dinner. <laughs> <laughs> My boy, just always think of his stomach. <laughs> Both Aang and Sokka start sprinting at Momo, and Momo starts freaking out and takes off. Aang follows Momo across the temple, and Sokka can't keep up. We cut back to the docks. Commander Zhao tells Zuko and Uncle Iroh that he's about to take off to find the Avatar, and Zuko is still upset. He starts talking back to Commander Zhao, which upsets Uncle Iroh. Commander Zhao starts insulting him by saying that he's just a banished prince with nothing and that his own father doesn't even want him. Zuko defends himself by saying how once he delivers the Avatar to his dad, it'll restore his rightful place on the throne. Commander Zhao insults him some more, even going as far as making fun of his scar. This sets Zuko over the edge. He challenges Commander Zhao to an Agni Kai, and Commander Zhao accepts. Uncle Iroh is like, dude, do you not remember what happened last time you fought a firebending master? And Zuko replies back that he'll never forget. Oh, yeah. I gotta say, like, the cinematography, like, I know they don't have a camera, uh -huh. but they're drawing it as if, you know, it's a camera, uh -huh. or it's camera work, yeah. and when Uncle Iroh is like, dude, do you not remember? It's like a pan to the right, and you see Zuko's face, and what is it, the good side of his face, yeah. and it pans to his scar. I just thought that was great. That's great cinematography right there. And, and once it ends, it, like, ends on his scar, and he's like, yes. I will never forget. It's so <laughs> dramatic. And I'm just like, ooh, goosebumps. <laughs> you know, I think the great thing about this show, and this is probably just from the creators, you know, just own influence. It's very, like you said, dramatic. It's, this is all stuff from like Kung Fu films. And I will not forget, you know, like very dishonorable, like they were dishonored and stuff like that. Or that kind of scene really, really shows that they're pulling from those kinds of movies, you know, the Kung Fu flicks that are, they're a bit cheesy and they're really dramatic, but it's like, man, it makes you feel really cool when you're watching this. You're like, yeah, I want this guy to win. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah I really like this person. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think another cool thing that I really liked in this whole episode is, again, like you were talking about shots and stuff like that. They're, they're very good at creating like establishing shots with the temple. And I think this is really cool, um, the juxtaposition between the air temple and the Fire Nation Navy that they're at right now where, you know, the ships and stuff like that. The Air Temple, much cooler colors, a lot more wide, open, very, like, mythical, serene shots. You go over to the military area with the Fire Nation, the Navy. It's very, I don't want to say dingy, but it's very grimy looking. You know, the colors are a lot darker. They're a lot more intense. Zack Snyder. Um, yeah, yeah. It feels very, very broody. Um, <laughs> it's like I'm Batman almost-esque, but it, it's it's very militaristic. It's very dark compared to that. And I think this is a great stark contrast between what's going on in the world. You know, there's still this beauty in this world while there's all this war and stuff going on. And I think those characters are, that's something they have to fight to protect. 
But yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see when these two characters' plot lines finally kind of collide. But I, I like the whole going back to the Avatar room. I really think that room is cool. That dumb trope where it's like, oh, I know these powers somehow because they're related to me. And you kind of see that in other kind of shows, like uh, recently My Hero Academia. It's a great anime manga if nobody's ever read it. Unrelated, but they kind of have that similar thing where like the past people that have had their power, they know who they were. And while they don't know them or know who exactly they are, they have this calling in them that just says, oh yeah, this is that person. So I think that's kind of like always been like a cool trope with like power being passed down to generation to generation. When I watched this as a kid, I was like, Zuko, you're so stupid. I still think, Zuko, you're so stupid. Why would you <laughs> challenge him to an Agni Kai? I, I think it's kind of Zuko's a bit of his arrogance, also a little bit of his pride taken in the way. While he is, you know, obvious that he's like, I will never forget. I'm not going to make the same mistake. He still decides to try to make the same mistake. But maybe because he believes in himself a little bit more. Like, he knows that he's going to be able to fight better this time or something. I don't really know why. But I, I think, again, it just has to deal with... This is the start of his character is that he's very prideful. He wants to do things his way. And I think that's important to his character. Because that, that really smacks him in the face in later episodes. Yeah. Oh man, even Uncle Iroh can't hold him back. He's like, Prince Zuko! Like, you know Uncle Iroh just wants to say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Can you just not? Please, for once, just don't. <laughs> like, I keep having to clean up your messes with my tea and stuff, but you keep making these messes, and I have to keep drinking tea. It's kind of annoying, because Zuko is too prideful sometimes, especially in these first few episodes. But uh, yeah, this this Agni Kai, it's about to go down. Side note, I think it's really cool that, especially with all the Asian influences and stuff like that, Agni is a fire god slash reference to fire from Hinduism. And Kai in Japanese means meeting. So it's literally a meeting of fire. <laughs> you're oh. taking, yeah, you're taking two words from, they're from different origins, but Agni is fire and then Kai in other Asian languages, I don't know exactly, but Kai means meeting in Japanese. And so it's meeting of fire, if you look at it that way. And that's what's going on. They're, they're about to duel with fire. <laughs> I did not know that. Wow. I had to look into it. I was Because I was curious. Because I knew what Agni meant. And I was like, what is Kai? The only thing that I could think of the word Kai was from, like I think it was like Dragon Ball Kai. So I had to look it up. And like I was like, what do these two combos of words mean? And I think it's really cool because it's not whitewashing or anything like that. It's it's very appreciative. It's very, you know, it uses it well and it establishes its own world while still having these like influences and stuff like that from it. It doesn't feel overdone or anything. Or it doesn't feel done wrong, I think. Going back to the sanctuary, I love like the trope of unlocking complex doors <laughs> that you can only unlock if you're the chosen one. <laughs> the Air Temple Sanctuary door, it reminds me a lot of the Harry Potter Chamber of Secrets door mm. with the snakes. Yeah. And just like the, you see it unlocking slowly uh -huh. and it finally opens. I just thought that was so cool. And then when they go inside the temple or inside the sanctuary, there's so many statues. <laughs> and you see not only the ground floor is full of statues, it goes up in a spiral. And you don't know, they never show you how tall this sanctuary is. It's, it seems endless. And then you find out that it's Aang's past lives. And you get a sense of this long lineage of ancestors before him. And there's something very magical about that. Like, he's not alone. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I mean, like you were saying, the whole door opening was very, very mystical. The whole room was very mystical. You could clearly tell there's a lot of influence from, like, fantasy and, like, history and stuff like that. You know, this whole lineage, this is Aang's history. And the kind of cool thing is it's, it's a spiral, like you're saying. And spirals can essentially go infinitely if you kind of do it correctly or something like that. Look <laughs> at it correctly. It's this infinite legacy that keeps going and going, and it's part of the cycle. A lot of, like, you know, thematic ideas that, you know, there's a cycle, the circle of life, all that stuff. Life keeps moving forward, but you always have this kind of, this common factor thing that always stays constant. In this world, the Avatar is that constant. The whole room, the whole building, that whole part, it just it feels legendary. It feels epic. And this is definitely that beginning of that idea that this whole story is going to be very epic. Yeah. Oh my god. When Sokka's like, dinner. I, <laughs> I he's died. Got, he's got my heart. He's just thinking about his stomach. 
I would probably be in the same situation. If I was Sokka and I had no powers or anything like that, I'm just like, yo, this kid used my food for fire. I'm hungry. Give me something. When I was recapping, I had to pause because I was cracking up so much. It reminds me of when I was in film school. I was working on a short film and it was about a TA that had a crush on one of the students. I was the director for that scene. It's his office hours and she like approaches him because she has a question, right? There was like a fantasy scene before that with her <laughs> and he's just, you know, like he's just fantasizing about being with her. And then it's the scene right after where he snaps out of it. And so I asked him, I was like, all right, you ready? Okay, action. And then when he starts, I didn't know this, but he like accumulated drool in his <laughs> mouth and he was like, oh yeah, I'm ready. And so when I said action, he let the drool flow down. <laughs> and it was so disgusting because like the student that he was obsessed with was like, ugh, are you okay? And he was like, oh, what? And he snapped out of his fantasy. And then like Sokka drooling over Momo like reminded me of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was gross. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this harkens back to the idea that it's a cartoon and it's going to have its comedy and like quips like that. And you wouldn't get that in like any normal show, I think. Like that's a, like a live action TV show. I think my favorite trope that always happens, I think it probably happens later in this show when they're stranded and they're looking for food and then they look at someone's head and it turns into like a turkey. <laughs> I think that's the kind of thing that happened with here with Momo and he's like, oh my God, I just want to eat that. So I think that's always like my favorite little joke that's always thrown into cartoons. Aang is still chasing Momo and Momo leads Aang into an unknown room. As Aang peels back the curtains, he discovers a bunch of dead bodies in Fire Nation clothing. And in the center of the room is the skeleton of a man wearing monk robes. As Aang gets closer, he notices the necklace on the skeleton and realizes that it's Monk Gyatso. He falls to his knees and starts crying. Sokka barges in and asks if he found Momo yet. He sees the dead bodies and realizes what happened and tries to comfort Aang, but Aang goes into the Avatar state. We cut back to the sanctuary. Katara is walking around and she pauses and looks at Avatar Roku's statue. Roku's eyes start glowing, but it's not just Roku's eyes that start glowing. All of the other statues start glowing as well. Katara realizes that something must be up and runs to find Aang. We get a montage of all of the other temples around the world and their statues glowing. A fire sage tells another fire sage to tell the fire lord that the avatar has returned. We go back to the room full of skeletons. Sokka's trying to calm Aang down, but it's not working. Aang airbends and hits Sokka with so much force that he flies back about 20 feet. Katara finally gets there and Sokka tells her what happened. Katara thinks that Aang triggered his avatar spirit and tells Sokka she's going to try to calm him down. We cut to the docks. The Agni Kai is about to start. Uncle Iroh coaches Prince Zuko to remember his firebending basics. Zuko isn't really listening. The Agni Kai starts. Zuko starts firebending first, but Commander Zhao dodges all the attacks. Zuko keeps firing away, but he's out of breath. Uncle Iroh yells at him from the sidelines to break his route. Now Commander Zhao is on the offensive. He starts fire punching at Prince Zuko and knocks him off of his feet. As Commander Zhao pounces on him to make the final blow, Prince Zuko sweeps his feet and Commander Zhao falls on his back. He recovers, but Prince Zuko starts firebending low on the ground, causing Commander Zhao to lose his balance. As he falls to the floor in defeat, Prince Zuko towers over him. Commander Zhao tells him to finish it, and Prince Zuko delivers the final blow. The camera cuts to a reverse shot of what happened. Prince Zuko missed on purpose, and Commander Zhao calls him a coward. Zuko starts walking away, but Commander Zhao fire kicks at him. Uncle Iroh stops the attack and throws Commander Zhao off of his feet. Zuko is fucking pissed. Uncle Iroh starts holding him back and tells him to not taint his victory. He then criticizes Commander Zhao for his behavior and says that even though Prince Zuko is banished, he's still way more honorable than him. He thanks Commander Zhao for the tea, and both Zuko and Uncle Iroh walk away. Zuko asks him if he meant what he said, and Uncle Iroh says, Of course, Jinxang tea is my favorite. <laughs> Zuko smiles. We cut back to the air temple. Katara's yelling at Aang that she knows what it's like to lose someone, since she experienced it herself when she lost her mom. She tells Aang that even though Monkey Atsu and the other airbenders are gone, he still has a family. She tells him that her and Sokka are his family now. Aang starts to calm down, and he lands back on the floor. 
Sokka promises Aang that they won't let anything happen to him, and Aang falls on the floor as he exits the Avatar state. Katara catches him, and Aang apologizes to her, but Katara says he has nothing to apologize for. Aang finally accepts that he's the last airbender, and Katara hugs him. We cut forward to the gang about to take off from the air temple. Aang doesn't know how Avatar Roku is supposed to help him, and Katara says don't worry, they'll find a way. Momo arrives and brings Sokka food. Sokka starts devouring all of it, just everything Momo brought him, and completely ignores everything Aang is telling him. <laughs> Aang tells Momo and Appa how they're all that's left of the Air Nation, and introduces Katara and Sokka to the flying lemur that he's holding. Katara asks what he's going to name him, and Aang says, Momo! As the gang flies away on Appa, Aang and Momo look back one last time at the Southern Air Temple as it slowly disappears. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> <laughs> it's the start of their journey. The, the gang's gathered. Well, not everybody yet, but, you know, they got their pets. And their family now. That's so sad. They don't ever explain it, but Momo's the last thing to ever survive at the Southern Air Temple. I, I guess so. I don't, I don't think they explain it, but can you imagine how he somehow survived? How lonely <laughs> he was? He, I mean, he obviously took to them very quickly if that was the case, and he stuck with a Like, it's a lemur. Why would he just, you know, go with them? I think these animals in this world are very smart, and they don't, obviously they don't talk, but they're very, especially later on with Appa, you know that these animals, they, they're intelligent, and they know what's going on kind of thing. But yeah, I mean... Momo was lonely. He's the last one, and he found something that reminded him of that past. So it's it's nice though that they at least got to be together again. You know, it's hopeful that they at least have each other still. Momo's been alone for a hundred years. <laughs> How old did Lemurs live till in this show? You know, that's a good question. <laughs> He's th- this guy. This, <laughs> this Lemurs live for a long time. Aang has an excuse. Momo doesn't. Have yeah, an I don't have no idea. Uh, plot hole, or maybe Lemurs just that really they live forever in the show. <laughs> Katara's like, there's no way no one could have survived in there for a hundred years. <laughs> Out pops Momo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny note. I actually named my dog Momo, <laughs> but I think it was partially the show because I don't even remember when this episode aired. I probably should look at the original air date and when I got my dog. I actually named him Momo because of where we got him from. <laughs> I got him from Missouri and the state name is Mo or like the, the, abbreviation. the, the, the abbreviation is Mo. And so I was like, well, we name him Momo because it's cute. And then I think in the back of my mind I was thinking of Avatar, but I don't remember when this episode aired or if I remember the show because of that. It's just funny because after that happened, everybody's like, oh, it's the same name as the lemur from Avatar. And I was like, you were like, sure, why not? Yeah, that makes it cooler, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and then you do see how intelligent Momo is because he knows that Sokka's hungry. (laughs) He brings him food. (laughs) Yeah, oh yeah. That's so yeah. cute. Sokka's got his priorities straight, man. All he cares about is that food. <laughs> He's just a simple man <laughs> with jokes and food on his mind all the time. He's the comic relief. You can't help it. You got your tropes in this. <laughs> but yeah, this is like my top five favorite Avatar scenes of all time. When Aang goes into the Avatar state and all of the statues light up. It's so epic when you see it's like a domino effect and it starts off with Avatar Roku and it spirals all the way up. And then you see the other temples all across the world lighting up too. Rewatching this, I was actually really bummed and I noticed that we like never saw an Earth Nation temple or a Water Nation temple. Only like the Fire Nation temple when they have to visit Roku. But I just thought that was like a missed opportunity. And maybe we'll get it in the Netflix show if they could go into that. That'd be cool. Yeah, I don't know why they did that personally. Maybe they just did it just to kind of like to keep the episode from going too long. Maybe maybe there's some cut scenes. I don't really know. Because yeah, it just goes from the Air Temple to the Fire Nation. Like, oh, we got to warn the king, the emperor, the Avatar's back. But I think they probably just did that just to keep it the flow going. And, you know, and also just this whole episode is revolving around the Air Temple and the Fire Nation. So I think it kind of was just keeping with that two track where it's, you know, one's on the air benders and then one's on the fire benders and fire nation 
Yeah. I'm also really confused because up until now, every episode, Aang's gone into the Avatar state. You see Aang in the first episode where he goes into the Avatar state for the first time and like freezes him and Appa. The second episode, he goes into the Avatar state to get away from Zuko and the Fire Nation. And then the third time is when the temples start lighting up. Mm -hmm. And so I was confused by that. Well, I've seen it episodes and stuff like that. I will say this is kind of feeling like my first watch because I I'm honestly don't remember lots of things. So. But I think maybe it has to deal with one location and where he was when he went into Avatar State possibly and also probably the emotion behind the scene. Mm. I think this was like his true awakening because it's kind of like the point where he realized he basically found his master dead and he realizes the severity of everything. Because that room is contrasting. You know, you have the one monk by himself. Yeah. Who is Gyatso, and then just like a bunch of dead fire soldiers. While it's it's kind of cool because it's like, oh man, he took them all with him, or I don't know what happened. You don't really know what happened at the temple. That's another mystery behind it. But you get the sense that yeah, this is probably like him actually entering Avatar State and hitting that point where you know it activates everything. Yeah, I think this is the first time he's conscious when he's in the Avatar State because mm -hmm. the first and second time you see him like coming out of a trance and he doesn't remember what he did. And whenever Katara asks him, he doesn't know how to respond. But this one, like, he can hear Katara yelling at him. Right. Okay, now now I got it. Because <laughs> later you see when Aang does go into the Avatar state, he can't control it. Like, he's there, he's conscious, but he can't control it yet. And then he finds the guru and all that happens. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's probably, I think it was just sensitive with such a strong surge of emotions. That's what kind of finally truly triggered everything. Otherwise, maybe it's just a plot hole. That's the easiest way to look at it. It's just a plot hole they didn't think about. And they're just like, whoops. <laughs> but I think it has to deal with mostly the emotion and the strength of what happened. I think that was like the true awakening. Yeah. Also, Sokka should have died again. <laughs> Did you see him? He flew back and he, he literally was like, ah, oh, boy, and then you hear a smack. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, fuck, is, is he okay? <laughs> Everybody in this world is made of, like, unbreakable bones, you know, no big deal. I noticed this and it's kind of cool when I talked about it earlier that this is one of the first kid shows I could think of that really were kind of, like, very serious and very serialized rather than episodic. This show was not, like, yeah, it doesn't show violence necessarily, like, blood and gore or some of that, but they're not afraid to show some dead bodies and be like, yo, these are these are people that died. I remember watching and being like, wow, is this a kid's show? <laughs> this is very dark. Like, you're actually dealing with a topic like genocide and the killing of a whole nation in a kid's show. That's crazy to me. Yeah, we get to know Monk Gyatso for 30 seconds most, and yet when we see his dead skeleton... It's so heartbreaking. I think what's heartbreaking for me, besides that, yeah, Monkey Yatsu seems like a cool guy. I would have liked to have known him if I was, you know, in that world. But also, I think it's mostly just most of my sadness comes from Aang. And that, yeah. again, this is when he really finally just realizes. And he states it at the end of the episode. He and Appa and Momo are the last of his kind. There's nothing left in their world anymore like them. And I, I think that was what's sad because it makes you like, dang, Aang is really lonely now. In the sense that he doesn't have anybody like him. But luckily, he does have the whole family aspect now, especially with Katara saying that, you know, we're your family now. But I, I agree, though, like this character that we barely know for 30 seconds probably made a lot of people go like, <gasps> when they saw the skeleton and the, the symbol, like a lot of people were probably like really sad when they first saw this scene. But that Agni Kai, though. <laughs> that, was some, that was some fierce firebending. I'm kind of glad we got to see a little bit of more of the firebending and stuff like that. I think Joanna noted it in like one of the first episodes. They were really pushing on that idea. Is that a lot of these fighting styles, like a lot of the bending styles, are from rooted in like actual martial arts. You really could see that a lot of like Shaolin Kung Fu, a lot of long fist. And I think that's really cool that they kind of wanted to base these bending styles on those martial arts. Again, going back to the whole Asian heritage and the whole influence, particularly with long fist and northern Shaolin. A lot of it's offensive. There's very rarely any blocks. I don't even think there's any actual blocking movements in that attack. If they have blocks, it's actually more of like a brush aside of attack or kind of more of a dodge. And that kind of goes with firebending. It's very fierce. It's very attacking. It's very aggressive. Uh, and then we didn't really see any in this episode, but I guess we could talk about it kind of because it's going to come up eventually later on. 
airbending is based off of, I think it's called Bagua Zhang. Sorry if I butcher the name of that because I don't speak Chinese at all. But that is a fighting style where it's more based on defense and more dodging. It's called like a circle, I think a circle movement. I don't know the exact name, but if you ever watch Aang doing his thing, like especially I think kind of going back to, I think it was like episode two when it was Zuko versus Aang and he kind of was going around his back and stuff like that. That's kind of that movement that Bagua uses. And a lot of those movements are based off of dodges and throws, which are kind of similar to what airbending is. It's very based on like trickery and making sure that you're on the defense and not caught off guard. It's very reactionary. And then I guess we've talked about later, but, you know, eventually you'll see it too with earth bending. It's very um, based off of Hunga and Tiger Crane Fist. I think it's a little bit of Prey Mantis style. I think Toph has it later on. And water bending Katara, she, a lot of that stuff is based off like Tai Chi movement. I think that's great that we get to see a fight scene with it. Yeah, they're not actually physically hitting each other because they're shooting fire out of their fists and, you know, their feet. But if you look at a lot of the moves that were animated here, they're all very based in reality. And that's really cool. And it's really awesome. I mean, yeah, obviously they're not going to get everything correct in terms of stances and looks exactly, but it's it's there. Agni Kai really shows that off, and I think that's, <laughs> I, I love that stuff. That's like my favorite aspect of the show is the martial arts part of it, I think. Yeah, you were in a martial arts club in college, right? Yes, I was. But yeah, I was at UCI. We we're part of a team called Chinese Association Martial Arts, aka Kama for short. They're actually kind of defunct, unfortunately, now. there's What? They got rid of it? Well, it just it died. Oh. <laughs> it just, nobody really wanted to take over. Now they have a new team called, and this is totally a little bit irrelevant, but they have a new team that's more based on tricking and stuff like that. And they're really cool. But anyways, yeah, we were, I was on a martial arts team. And we actually did one year do a set based on Avatar The Last Airbender. <gasps> no way. We even took the intro of the show and used that as our intro to the set. And so we all did martial arts styles based off of the show. Um, we even tried to add in like random things here and there to kind of try to create effects. <laughs> I think we did at one point and then I think we kind of nixed some of it because it was too much. It was like, ah, this is going to be hard to show on stage. <laughs> I think we wanted to do like some stupid stuff, but it, it, it got too complicated. So we just stuck with doing the fighting styles and the forms from it. But yeah, we, we did it. It was all based off that. We did a segment based on firebending which was like we did shaolin styles and then we did a tai chi segment which was for the water bending we did a hungar and a and we kind of were a little bit loose with the air bending because nobody really knows bagua in the group and it's kind of hard to do a form for it we did wushu for air bending since it was very kind of flowy and acrobatic in that similar sense we i think we did try to incorporate a little bit of bagua but it, we didn't know enough of it to do it it was fun. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I, I I just remember being like, "Hey, we should make a really cool set, and we could totally do it based on the Avatar because they're all fighting styles that are things that we mostly know." That's cool. That was really fun. What's the move called that Zuko does to like sweep Commander Zhao off his feet? I'll be a hundred percent honest. I'm not an expert in every move and technique in martial arts. Are you talking about like the one where he when he was already on the ground and he kind of did like the windmill kind of thing yeah. with his feet? Honestly, I don't know if there's any actual move in Shaolin like that because I really don't know all the moves. And it seems more of something that would be out of like something like Capoeira, which oh. is more of a Brazilian fighting style. Because honestly, sometimes they kind of just get away with, you know, like, oh, we're going to throw in this kick because it look cool. Yeah. <laughs> going back to the cinematography slash editing, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. I think I'm going to call it like the Avatar double take <laughs> where it's like a long shot of Zuko doing it, uh -huh. but it's so quick and it's so cool that they repeat it again, but this time they zoom in and then they zoom in again. <laughs> so it's like windmill sweep. Oh, you didn't see. Let, let me show you again. <laughs> windmill sweep. No, no, let me show you a third time how fucking badass Zuko is. Windmill sweep! <laughs> Does it, like, one of them go into slow-mo almost? Or is it, like... Yeah, yeah I think so. The last one's, like, slow motion. And it's slow mo. <laughs> I, I think that's also going back to, again, like, you know, influence from, like, kung fu f films and stuff. Like, I can want to say flicks and films at the same time. <laughs> so I'm saying flukes. <laughs> so kung fu flicks. Sometimes they have like repeated scenes of certain hits and stuff like that. Like they'll do a cut where a person's striking someone and as it's striking, it'll zoom in on the strike and you'll see it. So it's like more intense and stuff like that. <laughs> so I think they kind of do that with like Avatar where sometimes they repeat moves or like do a zoom in on it to kind of like really emphasize the technique. 
I, I agree though. Yeah, it's kind of it's a little cheesy, but it's it's cool. It's, it's like, so cool. It makes it really cool. And then he starts fire bending with his feet. Yeah. Low to the ground, and then Commander Zhao just can't. <laughs> That's when he's on the ropes. You can definitely tell. Yeah, I think Zuko going back on the offensive was very cool. It's very telling of Zuko that he doesn't back down, I think, too. I mean, besides the whole martial art aspect that we're talking about, going to characters now, he doesn't back down from his challenges if he feels like he could win. I think another cool thing to go back into this fight is really like kind of look at the relationship again between Iroh and, and Zuko is that while it seemed like he wasn't listening and stuff like that, there was a point where like Iroh was like, remember your basics in the middle of the fight. And it kind of goes into the, the sound of it. It's kind of muffled. So it sounds like it's in his head kind of thing. He's hearing mm. it. And that's when the fight starts turning. Like, you could tell the tides kind of start turning. Because I think that might have been actually the part where he tripped. I don't remember 100%. You could really tell that Zuko listens to him. He really does listen to Iroh while he acts angsty. Like, ah, I don't want to listen to you, old man. He's still being guided by him. And you can clearly see it when he says that and starts winning the fight. It's because he, he really listens to Iroh. And he, he did do what he was telling him. Remember his basics. Like, keep him grounded. And I think that's important that Iroh is always there to keep Zuko grounded. And then when Prince Zuko is towering over Commander Zhao and he's about to do the final blow and he purposefully misses and then Commander Zhao calls him a coward and tries to kill him with his back turned. <laughs> he's a hypocrite. That specific instance right there, besides everything else that's led up to it, that really nails in the fact that he is a bad guy. Commander Zhao is not a good person. There's never any points in the scene unless you're like, you're like, oh yeah, I like bad guys and stuff like that. There's never any time where you're like, oh yeah, I love Commander Zhao. I want him to win. You're just like, dude, I hate this guy. I don't like him at all. Zuko, on the other hand, you know, you kind of like him still. Like he's angsty, he's annoying, but you know, at the same time you're like, I kind of get where he's coming from and I kind of want him to succeed in the end. I would rather him win the fight than Commander Zhao. Yeah. I guess at this point, it's maybe like the lesser of two evils kind of thing. But yeah, there's nothing redeeming about Zhao. Commander Zhao is like a total hypocrite and a grade A scumbag. I really think this is driving home the idea that this is the first major villain. Zuko, while he is an antagonist in the sense right now, you could tell that they haven't done anything to make him like super villainous. Besides that, he's like, oh, I need to capture the Avatar. But with Zhao, he's just like, he's a jerk. He wants, he, will, he doesn't like Zuko. He belittles him a lot. Oh, and then when Uncle Iroh blocks Commander Zhao's attack with, what is it, his power stance, right? Yeah. And he, like, grabs his foot and does, <laughs> what is it, like a wrist throw? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Really. I kid you not, his arm doesn't even move. It's just, like, his wrist flick. <laughs> yeah. And he knocks him off his feet. It kind of shows, like, you know, how simple that movement is and how well-rooted it is. Because his stance is supposed to be strong in that part. And then how easily he's able to throw off Zhao. I think they're really foreshadowing with that kind of simple move. He's pretty strong and he knows what he's doing. So, I mean, I think this whole scene was really cool. and kind of shows a lot more about each character. Shows Zuko's ability to overcome odds as well as that he still listens to his uncle and appreciates him greatly. Zhao, he's a jerk and a coward and a hypocrite. And Iroh, he cares about his nephew and that he is probably a really badass firebender. We don't know that yet because yeah. he hasn't shown it yet. <laughs> yeah, there's hints of Uncle Iroh and he knows what he's doing. And Yen mentioned it in the previous episode where Uncle Iroh definitely gives advice and it's not empty. Like he's been through it himself. He knows what he's talking about. And so his advice is valid. He's just trying to guide Zuko and it's very powerful. And I love how it's like, I'm going to insult you, but thanks for the tea. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. I think Iroh is probably my favorite character in the show, to be honest. I like a lot of the characters. I love Boomy, Boom Boom, but yeah, <laughs> I like a lot of the older adults that are childlike, but I think Iroh is probably one of my favorite characters. He has a lot of depth to him while still being this very likable character, and you want to know more about him because you don't know his true motivation besides that he cares for Zuko. Yeah. I love how he deflects. Because when Zuko's like, um, did you really mean that, uncle? He's like, yeah, I love Jinxing T. Iroh's character is written very well. He has good quips. 
He's good comebacks, you know, like he plays well with any of the characters he interacts with, I think. I don't think there's any interaction in the show that he ever has. Like every time Iroh's in a scene, it he feels, steals the scene. Yeah. Like even the stu- like going back to the conversation earlier when they were having, you know, when uh, Zhao was pretty much interrogating Zuko. Iroh's just the background knocks down stuff and he's just like, <laughs> <"Mm?"> <laughs> like just totally subverts the seriousness of it it's not bad though because it's like oh dude I love this guy he's great he's written to not be annoying but also another form of comedic relief and I think that's I think that's a great part about Iroh but you know when he's serious he's serious it, not in this episode but I mean it showed a little bit but there's some later episodes where like he, when he needs to be serious he's serious oh before I forget what bender would you be like style? Or no, like, like uh, what? What bender would you be? Like a, a specific character? No, like like water bender. No, that's fire. what I meant. So like, what what style of bending would I use and stuff like that? Yeah, uh. we don't count lava bending yet. <laughs> oh, okay, hmm, that's tough. Have you asked this question for everybody? I forgot to ask Joanne and Anthony. Next okay. time I'll bring them in. I'll ask. Okay, I don't know because it's it's hard to say. If it was based off personality, probably be either fire maybe a bit of air because i'm very aggressive but i'm also very playful i love messing around so i, I could totally be like i can see myself being an airbender specifically like ang or gyatso but if i was going with my favorite just favorite benny style in general actually if i was thinking about it i'd probably say either earth bending or metal bending i think it's just a really cool style it's very strong it's very planted it's very to the earth and i, I really like the strength of it and you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. <laughs> like <laughs> rocks flying on rocks and stuff like that. <laughs> and like, you know, if I was to actually be it based off personality, probably be like fire, air. It's hard to say though. I mean, you just named all of it. Not Mars. water. <laughs> it ain't water. So definitely no. I think I think if I had to pick, like and just to be it, it'd be Earth. I think Earth is my favorite. And I, I would love to be an earthbender. <laughs> my eyes are earthbending. <laughs> earthbending. I'm sorry. It's just because like, I'm thinking of it as like a personality quiz. Like, or which house of Hogwarts would I be? And then I was like, uh. There is a BuzzFeed quiz. Uh, and it's pretty accurate. Really? Because I took it with like five people. And okay. we were like, there's no way. There's no way it's going to choose what we want it to be. <laughs> but then it did. Oh. And then there's even an option where you can be the avatar. Oh, okay. And Yen got it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. I think, and this is just a side note. I always think those quizzes are so funny, but there's like questions always in there that are like, you know what that answer is going to lead you toward. If like, you're doing the benders one, there's like a fire one, like you're a fiery personality. It's like, okay, that was fire bending. I hate that because there's always those questions that it's like obvious what it's going to be. But I mean, if you say it, it worked out well, then maybe I'll try it out sometime. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of BuzzFeed anymore. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's about it. Anything you want to add before we end it? I'm sorry that I screwed up Boomy's name earlier, but... Uh, Boom Boom <laughs> is so cute. <laughs> I was thinking of, like, Adventure Time, I think, because there's a, there's a thing with Boom Boom in Adventure Time. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Like, I'm looking forward to the rest of the show, like, rewatching it and actually, like, making sure I watch it through so I don't miss anything. But also... There are a lot of things groundbreaking about the show, <laughs> pun intended, because of earthbending. It's cool to go back and analyze this, especially with the Netflix series coming out soon. There's a lot to the show that I think a lot of people will miss. And I think it's just because they think it's a kid's cartoon. And especially with recent times, they've been really good about doing shows that are kids' cartoons that are, you know, they're made for adults too. So I think Avatar is one of those ones that kind of push that forward, that path, and that idea that animation isn't only for kids. I'm really excited about going through the rest of these episodes. Hopefully I'll be on the podcast again. Yeah, I'll bring um, you back. Yeah. Any um any plugins for our listeners? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. On Twitter if you follow me at um Expressive Gaming, that's my like that's my main Twitter handle and that's just I use that to just announce if I'm gonna be going on Twitch or anything like that. Follow me on twitch.tv slash expressives if you wanna watch me stream and talk more like this. I promise I'm a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your pickup line? I, uh, I promise I'm a fun time. If, I, if that was my pickup line, I'd be even more single than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> you follow me on Instagram, it's expressives as well. I mean, you probably just get pictures of beer and food. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you for being on the show discussing Avatar The Last Airbender because we're a bunch of millennials mm-hmm. analyzing an animated kids show in Maybe. our mid-twenties. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank, thanks for having me. I had a great time. I cannot wait for the next cup episode that I'm on because this was actually really fun. Yeah, as they say in the Avatar world, what's your favorite catchphrase? Uh, Flame me on, Hotsman. <laughs> Avatar State, yip yip. <laughs> <laughs>